Uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you very much for coming along tonight. And that includes all of you on uh, on YouTube and on Zoom, uh, even though I can't see your faces, which I'd love to see. Um, a few little notes, first of all. Uh, the fire exits, should anything actually happen, just follow the signage and uh, everything should be okay. Um, no problems there. Um, and also, secondly, could you switch off your mobile phones? Um, and if you do, uh, please don't take any photographs, but if you do want a recording of what's happening in any shape or form, I'm sure Karen wouldn't mind sending something to you if you ask her nicely. So, uh, there we are. Um, have we any apologies for absence, Andrew? Uh, just Catherine Miller. Just Catherine, yes. Right, okay, make a note of that. Uh, so, there we go. Andrew is actually uh, the Honourable Secretary, and he is now going to make a few announcements. It shouldn't take too long, um, but we've got to get over these for protocols. So, go <laughs> ahead, Andrew. Lovely. So, uh, just our uh, minutes of the last meeting, that was in November, it was our excellent joint lecture with the Geological Society of London and the Royal Astronomical Society uh, on the Winchcombe meteorite, and uh, we had a, a de decent turnout. Um, given how close to Christmas it was, uh, and uh, some, several interesting questions, and we're, we're hoping to get Luke's talk up soon. So uh, take that as a record of the meeting, Steve. Lovely. In terms of our next lecture, uh, our February lecture will be by Dr. Richard Curry. That will be on sustainable steel manufacture, uh, a timely topic, especially with the Materials Processing <coughs> Institute just down the road. Our March lecture will be on the modelling of mine water heat extraction. So this is uh, uh, all to do with the mine water heat projects around the northeast by Jeroen van Hoenen of the Geology Department in Durham. Uh, in April, we've got two, uh, two, possibly even three events once we uh, finalise the details. Uh, the first one is with the Columbia Mines Rescue Service uh, talk and will be joined by colleagues from Columbia via Zoom. Uh, and later on in April, we'll have a joint lecture with the Institute of Civil Engineers as part of the Geotechnical Engineering R of the A1. Looking towards May, uh, we'll have the fabrication and uh, practical applications of terahertz devices by Professor Andrew Gallant of the Engineering Department in Durham. Uh, and our final lecture to bring our 2021 to 22 programme to a close will be a uh, lecture on efficient ship design joined with the imar Est and the Royal Institution of Naval Architects. Uh, just a reminder, if you're looking for the abstract booklet uh, from our Mineral Extraction and Sustainability Conference last year, uh, it's now online, so just go and visit our website. We have plenty of interesting talks that we're, we're working on finalising, uh, hopefully some of the videos for. Uh, and of course, our institute was tangentially involved in uh, helping with the Royce Institute IMMM uh, 10 point plan as well. And uh, there's a few things in there about mine water heat, but there's an array, array of interesting ideas there. So do go and have a look at that. Uh, as ever, don't forget to follow us online. We're on all the major platforms. Uh, and also don't forget, of course, about the benefits of membership. Uh, you're currently enjoying one of our fabulous lectures and conferences. Uh, we've got our annual dinner coming up, hopefully in the next few months, and further details will be sent out to the membership, uh, where we've got a number of social events going as well throughout the year, and we're also working on a field trip, hopefully to go and see the uh, site of the giant millipede that was recently found at Northumbria. If you'd like to uh, get involved with the Institute, uh, the best way to do that is via membership. You get a range of excellent membership benefits from postnomials to all sorts of extra invitations uh, and all sorts of other benefits. So if you're not already a member, do remember to go and check that one out, mindinginstitute.org.uk forward slash membership. So there we are, Steve. Uh, I shall now hand you hand back over to you uh, and we shall move on to the, the main event of the evening. <laughs> Yes, indeed. Thank you very much, Andrew. Right. Uh, well, here we are. The, as I say, the main event of the evening. I hope you'll uh, forgive some of my uh, my speaking here because there's some quite difficult words in here. <laughs> so this evening we have uh, Dr. Karen Johnston of Durham University to speak with us uh, on probing ion mobility in solid electrolytes for future all solid state batteries. Karen's a lecturer in inorganic chemistry at Durham University. 
and obtained a Bachelor of Science in Chemistry and Mathematics from the University of St. Andrews in 2006. She continued in St. Andrews and obtained a Doctor uh, in Chemistry in 2010. Following her research, she undertook postdoctoral work at the University of Windsor, Ontario, Canada. Karen completed a second postdoctoral position in the Advanced Lithium Storage European Research Institute. Uh, research interests are in uh, materials chemistry, concentrating on the design and structural characterization of new materials. Her current research aims to combine high resolution power diffraction, X ray and neutron, with multi nuclear solid state NMR and first principles DFT calculations to study structure in the solid state. She's interested in the characterization of both ordered and disordered materials. And her current areas of interest include high temperature ceramics, that is, perovskite based systems. She's also interested in conversion material for use in the negative electrodes in uh, lithium and uh, any ion batteries. One area of particular interest is the design, the synthesis, and characterization of novel solid electrolyte materials for use in both uh, lithium and uh, any ion batteries. But that's enough from me. Let's get on to the real interesting part. Karen, could you take the table for me? Thank you. Okay, so I'd like to start by thanking you for the very kind invitation to come and present here today. Um, I'm very excited to talk to people who are outside my field about batteries um, and the exciting challenges that batteries offer um, in terms of research. So um, for my lecture tonight, I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the work that we've been doing in Durham regarding probing eye mobility within solid electrolytes for future all solid state batteries. So I'm going to start tonight by um, sort of briefly introdu introducing the concept of all solid state batteries and in particular thinking about um, all so uh, sorry, solid electrolyte materials and exploring new materials for these types of applications. I'll then move on and sort of briefly explain why it's important for us as chemists to really understand um, these structure property relationships that we often, um, that are so essential to the, the properties that take place. I'll then move on and briefly discuss some of the methods and techniques that I use in my research group, in particular solid state NMR and quantum chemical calculations, but don't worry, I'm not going to go into in too much detail. Um, and then the main focus of my talk will be two sort of case studies, if you like, thinking about um, hydration effects in a class of materials known as lithium-rich antiperovskites, which is one main area that I look at, and then also looking at some lithium-stuffed garnets and what happens when we dope different elements into those garnets. And then I'll finish with a summary, some conclusions, and an outlook on sort of where battery research is and where it's going in the future. Okay, so development of all solid-state batteries. So we all know that um, there are currently two major challenges within energy-related research. They are the declining world reserves of fossil fuels and the rapidly rising CO2 levels. Now, we also know that there are many possible solutions to these problems, always on the news. So some of the things we can do is we can decrease our, our usage of fossil fuels, we can reduce our CO2 emissions by increasing our own efficiency, we can adopt things like carbon capture methods, or we can increase our use of renewable energy sources, such as solar, tidal, and wind power. Now, whilst renewables are excellent in their ability to provide energy, they're notoriously intermittent in their ability to provide this energy on demand. So what we really need is a method to store the energy they provide that we can then use at a later date. Now, one potential solution to this problem is the lithium-ion battery, which has undoubtedly revolutionized global communication and the technology industry within recent years. Now, lithium-ion batteries are composed of a positive and a negative electrode, and those two are separated by a lithium conducting electrolyte, which is a solution. Now, in current commercial lithium ion batteries, the positive electrode is composed of lithium cobalt oxide, and the negative electrode is composed of graphite. And during operation or during charge, lithium ions will move from the lithium cobalt oxide through the electrolyte and they'll insert or intercalate themselves between the layers of the graphite. And then upon discharge, the exact reverse process occurs. The lithium ions return to the lithium cobalt oxide. 
making this a fully reversible process that works many, many times. You know that you charge your phone, and it dies, the battery dies, then you recharge it. This process is happening continuously, and it works really well. But we as consumers and researchers always want to know, are there new materials that can give us just a little bit better performance? Is there something that can make me not have to charge my phone every night? Can something make a battery last for much, much longer? So current commercial lithium-ion batteries, one of the major problems with them is the fact that they have this liquid electrolyte. So the thing that allows lithium ions to flow from one side to the other is a major problem because it's um, made of materials that are highly flammable. Like they're in a protective casing for a reason. It's all done under and out um, conditions so that you're not penetrating that electrolyte and being exposed to anything that's dangerous. So what we would really like to do is try and replace that liquid electrolyte with a solid state equivalent. And if we can do that, the safety of the battery is significantly enhanced. Okay? But obviously we need to find a material that has a performance equivalent to or better than that liquid electrolyte. Now, one thing that we're interested in, so if you start to put a solid in the center of this battery, you need to understand things like the relationship between structure and physical properties. You need to understand how the structure is dictating how those ions can move in the solid state. And this is sort of the area that I'm interested in, is trying to understand the relationship between structure and physical properties. But more than that, can I understand the structure in such a way that actually... Um, I can sort of design new materials with a specific structure type to get the best possible ion conduction for materials. And then leading on from that, can you then sort of design materials with very specific applications in mind? So in recent years, lots and lots of different materials have been suggested as possible solid electrolyte materials, both for lithium and for sodium ion batteries. And these include things like your very common um, acite deficient perovskites. So lots of these are based on mineral type structures. Um, more commonly, things like lysicon and nasicon type systems have become quite popular. People trying to dope them and see if we can get better performance. And in recent years, garnets and lithium rich antiperovskites have also gained quite a lot of attention. And I'll talk about these two classes of materials today. So what are some of the methods and techniques that we use to try and understand this structure-property relationship? Well, the sort of research approach that I have in my lab um, basically starts with us trying to make the materials. So we try and make the materials in our lab using conventional solid-state chemistry methods. And these aren't particularly complicated. You say it's a bit like cooking, actually. You put your materials, you mix them, you put them into a high-temperature furnace, and you heat them for sometimes minutes, sometimes hours, sometimes days and, or weeks. Um, occasionally, we can use softer chemical methods, known as sol gel um, methods, and increasingly, we're starting to use more air and moisture-sensitive methods based on the fact that the application is, is moisture and air-sensitive. Once we've made our materials, they then undergo comprehensive structural characterization using a variety of different complementary techniques. And essentially what we're trying to do here, using things like X-ray neutron powder diffraction, is look at the long-range structure of a material. And we combine this with a complementary method known as solid-state animal, and that looks much more closely at the local structure of a material. So by combining the two, we're getting both the long and the short-range information we need. Once we've characterized our material, we then start to think about the physical properties. So could these materials perform as electrolytes? So we want to look at things like their electrochemical performance, so how they perform in a cell, look at the impedance spectroscopy to look at how ions hop within a material, and then we use this technique known as muon spin relaxation, which also tells us about hopping of ions within a material. Once we've sort of characterized our potential for physical properties, we can then start to think about applications putting these things into lithium and sodium ion batteries, and then ultimately, the desirable goal is to finish by putting it into a future all-solid state battery. So the method of characterization that you want to use really does depend on the type of information that you want. If you want to know about bulk properties, then you do very specific um, characterization methods looking at the bulk. If I wanted to look at the microstructure of a material, then I would use micros microscopy type methods, so actually looking at the crystallite size and shape. Um, as I mentioned before, if I want to look at the long-range structure of a material, diffraction-based techniques are really useful. And if I want to look more locally, 
spectroscopy-based methods are useful. So, for example, looking at bond rotations or vibrations, things like that. Now, the technique that I use a lot is nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, or NMR. So, NMR is actually important in every single person's everyday life. You just don't know that it's been used but, uh, before it gets to the final application. So, for example, NMR has been used extensively in protein structure determination and functionality um, as well. Um, it's used extensively in medicinal chemistry. So, pharmaceutical companies use NMR to make sure that the ac active pharmaceutical ingredient that they have in the tablet that you're going to take is correct. Um, in addition to this, it's also used in areas like catalysis to look at chemical reactions and see how they actually proceed and how they happen. And then probably most common to you um, as a as sort of general public would be magnetic resonance imaging. So if you've ever been for an MRI scan, that is a form of magnetic resonance. We just do that on humans rather than samples. <laughs> um, so what can NMR actually do? So NMR can tell us a lot about the structure of the material. As I said, it's looking more locally at things rather than the long-range structure. But it can also tell us about the presence and nature of anything that's unusual. So if you have any strange disordering or any strange, unusual defects within that structure, diffraction can tell us, uh, sorry, NMR can tell us a lot about that. In addition, you can do some in situ methods. So you could choose to do NMR in situ whilst monitoring another type of reaction. So you could do this for catalysis, or you could even do it for electrochemistry. You could cycle a battery while doing your NMR experiment and look at the electrochemical reaction occurring and link that to structure and changes that happen. So NMR has lots of useful properties for studying um, different materials. And the main thing that's really attractive about NMR is it's element specific. So if I only want to look at lithium, I can choose to only look at lithium. And in the case of batteries, that's really useful because I want to look at the movement of the lithium and see how it shuttles from one side to the other in that battery. Unlike diffraction, there's no requirement for crystallinity. So I can look at any type of material I want, a glass, a polymer, a liquid, or a solid. Anything you want, you can look at. Um, it's sensitive to dynamics, which is really, really good for battery studies because we can look at those, um, the ion movement and the ion transport. And then increasingly, it's, it's really good for quantitative information. So you can home in on the element that you're wanting to look at and find out how much of that is in one particular environment within your structure. So lots of information available from NMR. So this is the, the one complicated slide I have. <laughs> so what is NMR in terms of how do we actually do it and uh, like what is the process? So nuclear magnetic resonance depends on nuclei um, and all nuclei have inherent angular momentum, which is a, um, a form of, sort of rotation which is called spin. And this spin is defined by a spin quantum number. And the spin quantum number can have any number from zero up to any integer or half integer value. And it's defined by the number of protons and neutrons that you have inside your nucleus. Now, the most common example is proton, and it's a spin one half nucleus. Okay, so anything that's got a proton in it, you can study using NMR. And if I was to have my sample just sat on the bench like this, then my spins are completely randomly oriented in all possible directions, because I haven't done anything to the sample yet. If I want to then do NMR on my sample, I take my sample, I put it into what's known as my spectrometer, which I'll show you a picture of in a second. But the spectrometer contains a very high magnetic field strength. So I place my sample into the magnetic field, and as soon as I do that, I've defined a field um, of magnetization. And what happens is that dictates on the spin whether it's going to align with the field or against the field. So you can see here, my spins are now no longer randomly oriented. They're either up or they're down. Now, these spins will have different energies depending on if they're up with the field or down. If they're aligned with the field, they'll be in the lower energy level here. And if they're against the field, they'll be in the higher upper energy level. So what an NMR experiment is doing is it's basically trying to provide enough energy to get these spins to flip. So you want it to go from being aligned to being um, not aligned with the field. And what we do is we can apply a pulse to get this energy difference to basically make this spin flip. 
And so this is us supplying a pulse to get the, the spin to flip. And then we listen for the response from the spin. And that's where all the structural information is. Once we listen for this um, response, we can do a Fourier transformation, which is just a mathematical um, manipulation of this to try and get peaks in a format where we can actually see some structural information. And the actual position of the peak will depend on the energy that was required to make that spin flip. Okay, so this is an example of an NMR experiment. And this is our large magnetic field. This is the most expensive part of the entire setup. So the, the sort of whole thing can cost anywhere from half a million up to several million, depending on what strength the field is that you have here. Um, and they do vary. So we typically have smaller fields in sort of universities, but you have national high field facilities where you can get time to do experiments. But generally speaking, about a million pounds, I would say, total for this equipment. Um, your sample sits in here in this magnetic field. And as I said, this is the sort of expensive bit. All of this is sort of additional to that magnetic field. So you would sit here at the computer and you would control the experiment that you're doing inside that magnet. OK, so if you were a chemist, you would do a lot of NMR in undergraduate um, chemistry. So you would do it until you were sick of it, basically. And I guess what I'm trying to get to here is what an NMR spectrum will look like in solution state. So it will look like this, for example, for this um, a proton NMR of this dipeptide. All I want you to take from this is the fact you have very nice sharp lines. You can get some sort of splitting between the, the different peaks. And you can get what looks like a lot of information from that. Okay? And the reason it looks like that is because it's in solution. So if we imagine what happens in a solution, you have rapid molecular tumbling of all of your species. And what that does is it actually averages out any directional interactions, which we call orientational interactions. So it removes them, meaning that you get these very nice sharp peaks. If we think about what happens in the solid state, which is where I have to study my materials, the situation is totally different. So you can see that this is the same proton NMR spectrum of the same dipeptide, but now we're in the solid state. And you can see there's considerably less information available from this really, really broad featureless line. And this is because now, in the solid state, we now have all of these um, orientationally dependent interactions present simultaneously. And what that does is it just clutters the spectrum to the point where we can't really see the structural information that we want. And really what we need is to get it to be more like something we could see in solution state. So these are lots and lots of different types of um, interactions that are available in NMR. I'm not going to go into them, but all I'm going to say is it tells you about things like what the specific coordination sphere is of, say, the lithium, what's around that lithium, what's the symmetry like, what's um, coordinating to it, what's bonding to it. That's the type of information we can get from um, these interactions. Now, lots of people, so if I was to ask a solution state NMR person what they think the information is I can get from a solid state spectrum, they would turn around and say pretty much nothing because they're so used to seeing the lines with very sharp, well-defined peaks. Um, so they, they basically think that there's no information available. But actually, the complete opposite is true. We have all of these interactions present simultaneously in one spectrum. The problem isn't a lack of information. It's more of an overload of information. So what we need to do is find ways of trying to extract the relevant information that we need. So what we can do is we know that the anisotropic interactions, so the directional interactions, are causing us to get these very broad resonances. So we know that in solution state, because of that m rapid molecular tumbling, we can narrow those lines. So why don't we just mimic that in the solid state? And that's exactly what we can do using a technique known as magic angle spinning. So we take our sample and we pack it into what's known as a rotor. And we align that rotor at what's known as the magic angle, which is 54.7 degrees. And then we spin that sample really, really quickly to mimic that solution state um, that we know works really well. And when we do this for things like proton, silicon, carbon, the sort of most common spin one half nuclei, this works really well. And you can see we get spectra that look similar to what we observed in the solution state. 
We can also do this for spin greater than one half, which are known as quad polynuclei. And unfortunately, this is the area I work in. Nothing is ever simple. So we can still do this magic angle spinning, and it reduces those line widths, which is good. But in many cases, it's still difficult to find precisely how many lithium sites you have, sodium sites, the number of, of environments that you're actually looking at. So in such cases, we might, what we need to do is then apply two-dimensional techniques, such as multiple quantum magic angle spinning or satellite transition magic angle spinning. Now, I'm not going to go into that, um, but we essentially get these plots here that can be read exactly like a contour map as if you were going hiking in the Lake District. So the contours, the closer they are together, they indicate a peak. And what you're looking for is how many peaks you have um, in your spectrum. So if you just counted up the number of um, sort of ridges that correspond to each peak, you would see that you've got six um, peaks here, so six environments. It's as simple as that is how we're going to interpret it. Okay, so increasingly in NMR, what we need is a way of sort of validating our experimental observations. So one thing we can do is we can actually use chemical, uh, quantum chemical calculations to calculate the NMR observable. So we can almost like predict the answer before we've made the material and run the experiment. And that's really, really good because it narrows down how you can experiment. So um, DFT calculations are really useful for helping us to interpret and assign um, data, but also, much more than that, they can give us information on defects, they can give us information on disordering, any dynamics, so if you've got movement, and even, in some cases, the functionality of a material. So lots of information can be obtained from these. Okay, so the first solid electrolyte system I'm going to talk about today is um, exploring hydration effects in lithium-rich antiperovskites. So in recent years, I should say that this project has been done in collaboration with Professor Saiful Islam, who was at Bath, but has recently moved to Oxford, um, and his very talented postdoc, Dr. James Dawson, who's now actually here in Newcastle as one of their new fellows. Um, so in recent years, these lithium-rich antiperovskites have become increasingly popular um, within the field of solid electrolytes. So they're not new materials, but the potential application of them is a new sort of direction. Um, and the reason these became or have gained so much interest is because of this initial paper that was published in 2012 in JAX. Now, if we think about a conventional perovskite, the most common perovskite that we um, sort of know is calcium titanate. Now, all we need to know about calcium titanate is that on the A and the B site, we have metals, so cations, and on the anion site, we have oxygen. Now, to make an antiperovskite, we're going to take that structure and we're going to turn it upside down. So wherever we had a cation or a metal before, we now have an anion, and vice versa, wherever we had an anion, we now have a metal. So if we do that, we can then produce um, this antiperovskite, Li3OX, where X is something like chlorine bromine. Okay. Now, the reason this type of material gained so much interest in, these, um, in this JAX paper was because they reported very high ion at conductivities, 10 to the minus 3 siemens per centimetre at room temperature, and very low activation energies. Okay, so these, this paper claimed that these have the potential to be similar or better than the um, liquid electrolytes that we're trying to uh, replicate. Now, subsequent studies on these materials have actually shown that these numbers are questionable. questionable. So the numbers reported are now lower um, than the uh, reported ionic conductivities and the activation energies are much higher. So we thought, what's going on here? There's a bit of a discrepancy within the literature. So the first thing we wanted to do was to just try and reproduce what that paper had produced in 2012. So to do that, we tried to make this Li3OCl. And it's a fairly simple reaction, or the concept's fairly simple. You have to do everything under inert atmosphere, so you have to do it under um, vacuum. And the actual principle is that you take the very cheap starting materials, which is lithium chloride and lithium hydroxide, you heat the mass up past the point that they melt, and then when they melt, the idea is that the Li3OCl should just crystallize out like a perfect crystal. Now, we all know that chemistry is not really like that. Um, so my PhD student worked on this for about 18 months. Um, and 
in all cases, I mean, that's a lot of reactions to be in 18 months, and in every single case, she never produced LI3OCL. She produced a lot of other things that we don't know, but she never produced any LI3OCL. It was always a mix of sort of starting reagents or non stoichiometric phases. And it was just a mess, to be honest. So we decided to abandon that synthetic approach and do something different. We decided to take some small um, furnaces, so heating devices, inside a glove box, which is an inert atmosphere, and um, place, and do the entire reaction inside the glove box. This time, using slightly different starting reagents, lithium chloride and lithium oxide, but the principles are the same. You heat it up, and the Li3OCl should just crystallize out. Now, again, we tried lots of different temperatures, different times, lots of different um, variables for reaction conditions. And in some cases, we did manage to produce small amounts of the Li3OCl, but nothing like the quantities that have been reported in that paper. So at this point, we started to think, can you actually make this phase? Does it really exist, or did they lie in their paper? So it made us think, is it actually more like a metastable or kinetic phase, i.e. something that can't be isolated in the bulk? So because we would had no luck with this whatsoever, we decided to change direction slightly. And we decided to look at the hydrated analogues of these materials, which were sort of well reported um, within the literature. And it turns out you can make them with relative ease. These things literally do just fall out when you heat them, doing exactly the same as we did for the, the previous um, materials. And when you look into the literature in this a little bit more, you find that there's actually two phases of Li2OHCl, which is sort of like the end member of the series, if you like. Um, you have a room temperature phase, which is believed to be orthorhombic, and a high temperature phase, which is believed to be cubic. Now, because this was a collaborative, collaborative effort, with, effort with Seifel and James, we decided to do some DFT calculations to try and predict the ground state, so the lowest possible energy conformation of this material. And what we found was that the, the ground state for Li2OHCl was actually a tetragonal phase, not orthorhombic. And you don't need to worry about what that means, but in this particular structure, it looked like all of the OH groups were aligned along one particular axis, along the A direction. And that was in total contrast to the high temperature phase, where the OH groups appear to be totally randomly oriented within the structure. So sort of what's causing these differences. So the first thing we tried to do was actually take our sample of Li2OHCl and heat it up to see if we could observe this known phase transition. And we did this initially using X-ray diffraction, so just looking at the long-range structure of the material, does it change as a function of temperature? And the answer was yes, you see a very distinct change between sort of 40, 45, and 50 degrees C, i.e. you see lots of peaks disappear, and you get sort of very uh, much fewer peaks um, in the higher temperatures. So we could clearly observe this phase transition that was taking place. We also tried to do this through NMR. And remember, just think about NMR quite simply, just how many peaks do you have and what are they doing, right? That's all I want you to take from this. So in the proton NMR, you see that we can do this as a function of temperature to try and look at what's happening to that, uh, the um, proton environment. And if we just sort of zoom in on that central peak, because that's the bit we're interested in, you can see that it starts very broad at room temperature, but then it gets narrower as we increase the temperature. And this is what we would expect to happen in these types of systems. You can also do this for lithium-7. And again, we're just going to zoom in on that central peak here. And again, you can see we have something that's really broad going to something that's narrow as a function of temperature. So something's changing in there. So what we can then do is actually measure how much that line is changing as a function of temperature by looking at something known as the full width at half maximum. And if we do this, we find that between minus 19 and 33 degrees C, there's basically no change in the line, which in terms of NMR tells us that the um, proton is totally static at that point. It's not doing anything. After that point, it does start to move. And it looks like um, you can observe the phase transition, which is what we expected, but it also looks like there's some form of mobility of those OH groups, probably something like a rotation around a point. We can do exactly the same for the lithium. And what we see in this case is, you, well, you can clearly identify the phase transition, which is occurring here. But what we see is a much greater line narrowing. So the line gets much, much um, more narrow relative to the um, proton. 
And what that seems to suggest is you've got a different type of mobility occurring in the lithium relative to the proton. Now, we looked at the whole series, so not just Li2OHDL, but changing the lithium and the proton content, and we see exactly the same across the series. So this is not an anomaly, this is happening consistently. So obviously, the lithium is the thing that's going to move if this was to become a solid electrolyte. So we really want to know how that lithium is moving within our material. Um, now, in NMR, we're quite limited in how much um, in terms we can go up in terms of temperature. So what we were able to do was some lithium studies over a really large temperature range between minus 65 up to 230 degrees C. And what that allowed us to do is just to see how much that peak is going to narrow across this temperature range. And you can see it starts very, very broad, and then it's, everything's on top of each other. It's really difficult to see, but it's really, really narrow. So we can then look at something known as our T1, which is looking at relaxation. So it's looking at that lithium and seeing what it's doing, um, how it's relaxing and how it's changing over a period of time, uh, and how the temperature's affecting it. And what we can do is plot the T1 values for both proton and for lithium. And all we want to do is compare these at the same temperature and see what they, what they tell us. And if you look at the two values, at 100 degrees C, there's an order of magnitude difference in the numbers. And in terms of NMR, what that generally tells us is that there's two different types of mobility. It's suggesting that the protons are only locally mobile, for example, moving around a point, whereas the lithium must be free to move throughout the structure. So if this was to be considered as a solid electron material, it has the potential to have lithium mobility and lithium movement. So in NMR, one of the things we can do is specifically choose a certain nucleus to study if you think that you have a type of motion. And because we know that there's some motion in the lithium and some motion in the, uh, in the proton, we can actually manipulate the proton environment so that we can look at it more closely and see what type of movement's occurring. And to do this in NMR, you typically use deuterium NMR because it's well known and well reported for studying anything that's to do with dynamics and motion. So we were able to deuterate a sample, so basically put this um, 2H into the um, sample of Li2OHCl using li deuterated lithium hydroxide, and then we could study it as a function of temperature. Right, so the spectra look a little bit different here to what I've, seen, what I've shown you before. So you're not looking at the individual position of each peak, you're looking at the overall shape that all of the peaks produce. Okay? So if I was to draw it out for the minus 19, it's the overall shape is like this. Okay? It's just the way that we process it and the way we do this experiment is slightly different to what I've shown you before. But the main point here is that the spectrum that we see at minus 19 and at 33 degrees C are identical. And what we can do is simulate that and extract some parameters. And essentially, what this is telling us in terms of NMR is that those protons are static. They're not moving at minus 19 or 33 degrees C, which is good. That's in agreement with our previous data. What we can then do is take it up higher in temperature. So remember that that phase transition from orthorhombic to cubic occurs around between 45 and 50 degrees. Okay. Now, it has been reported in the literature that that phase transition alone results in this really high iron at conductivity that I mentioned in the 2012 JAX paper. Now, you'll see my bottom temperature here, so I'm looking at 63, 69, 95, and 110 degrees C. Okay? At 63 degrees C, the spectrum looks pretty much identical to what we're seeing at minus 19 and 33 degrees C. It hasn't changed. But... We're at 63, so it's clearly undergone that phase transition that says it's a super ionic conductor at that point. But the protons are still static. There's no movement. When we increase that temperature further to 69, you'll see that we start to get some of something unusual happening. We have a sort of a broad peak coming here in the center, but we still have this manifold of bands around that broad peak. And then as we increase the temperature further to 95 and 110, the same thing happens in that this broad thing that started in 69 becomes the dominant species. Okay, so what, what this is telling us is we have static at 63, static proton environment. As we increase the temperature, we start to get gradual movement of those OH groups at 69. That's what this bit means. And then at 95 and 110, the majority of the um, protons are moving in some way. They're mobile. 
But what's quite important here to note is that you still have the presence of these weird sidebands at both 95. You can't see them in this 110, but they are, in fact, there as well. So what that's telling us is actually you don't just get complete change of the structure. There's like a gradual process that's occurring, and you actually have the coexistence of two different proton environments, one that's stationary and one that's moving. So what's causing that? And quite interestingly, it seems to suggest that, well, the phase transition alone isn't responsible for this super ionic conductivity as it's been described, and also it seems to suggest that the lithium mobility is related to the proton mobility, which I'll come to in a second. But really interesting that the NMR was able to indicate that we have the presence of these two different proton environments, one that's static and one that's moving. So again, because of this was sort of work in combination with Seifel and James, they decided to do some ab initio molecular dynamics calculations. And basically, what they wanted to see was, from their calculations, could they see any lithium diffusion? Could they see any proton diffusion? And how does that correlate with our experiments? So they can do mean square displacement plots as a function of temperature and all that uh, time, sorry. And all that's doing is it's basically trying to see if the lithium is moving and if the proton's moving, if the oxygen is moving, and if the Cl is moving. So the oxygen and the chlorine have flat lines. They're not moving at all. The proton sort of starts increasing but then flattens out and never really goes past two angstroms. And then the lithium, you can see, continues to go up and up and up, indicating that you have lithium diffusion within these materials. And actually, when you look at these uh, density plots of the trajectories, they can actually see the movement of the lithium when they zoom in on the, the figure, and you can see it happening via a vacancy. Um, and that's different to the proton, which just sort of sits at this localized point and doesn't, doesn't move between uh, the species there. Again, James and Seifel looked at this across a series, like we were doing for the experiment, and they see consistent um, similar behavior across the series, which basically says that there is lithium ion diffusion, and this seems to increase when you change the proton content. So the more protons you put in there, the greater the lithium diffusion that you observe, and that's likely caused by the fact that you're putting more vacancies in there, so there's more opportunity for those lithium ions to actually hop between different vacancies. So in our NMR, one of the things that we can do is to try and understand how that lithium is actually moving. So at this point, we've basically said we think it's moving, but we haven't got any firm evidence to say it's moving throughout the structure. And PFG NMR, which is pulse field gradient NMR, is one way, way that we can actually categorically say, yes, there is diffusion of those lithium ions, and this could be a material for things like solid electrolytes. And how this works is you do your normal NMR experiment, but instead of, um, so you, there's one additional thing that you need to change or one variable you need to change, and you apply a gradient to that experiment, and you change the gradient as the experiment goes on. So what you're looking for if you do have diffusion is that the signal from the NMR will change as a function of that gradient strength. So the more uh, gradient that you increase on your experiment, you should start to see a fall off in signal. And that's exactly what we see here for our lithium signal. And you can manipulate this data to get a diffusion coefficient, and then you can compare that with the diffusion coefficient that James and Seifel obtained from their calculations, and actually it's in good agreement. We also did this for um, proton, and you'll see that I've presented it differently. I've presented it as a spectrum. And that's because there is absolutely no change, either at room temperature or at 100 degrees C, irrespective of the gradient strength that we've put on this experiment. So what this is confirming to us is that there is lithium ion diffusion, i.e. lithium ions can move throughout the structure, but protons are limited around a single point. Okay, so putting all this together, what does this actually mean? So we think that we have a mechanism for what happens in Li2OHCl and why it could be a potential ion conductor. So you start at lower temperatures and you're in the um, lower symmetry structure, or thrombic or tetragonal, who knows, that's up for debate still. But as you increase the temperature, you undergo that phase transition to ten, uh, cubic structure. That alone is not enough to get this enhanced ionic conductivity. You still need more temperature to get those lithium ions to move. And what we find, or what we think is happening based on calculations and experiment, is that the lithium ion will start to move or hop into vacant sites, for example, here. 
Now, you'll notice that this OH group here is originally pointing towards this vacancy. Now, as this lithium ion hops down into this vacancy and fills it, it then creates a square or a vacancy there. Now, what then happens to this OH group is it doesn't like being close to that lithium. It wants to have maximum amount of space because, remember, it's going to try and rotate around a point. So the OH group undergoes a rotation and moves towards what's now the newly created vacancy. So at lower temperatures, or sort of just after the phase transition, you're going to have a few lithium ions hopping here and there, but the majority are still going to have static OH groups, um, or like local mobility groups. Um, but as you increase the temperature further, you're going to have more and more lithium ions hopping, so you're going to have um, this constant rotation of the OH groups between a vacancy and being filled. Okay, so essentially, the thing we've discovered is that this OH group will always rotate or move to try and compensate where the lithium has gone. So if it's filled a vacancy, it will move to always point towards a vacancy. And that fits, if you remember I said, in the cubic phase, when James and Seifel did the calculations, the um, OH groups were randomly oriented, and it turns out they're always randomly oriented towards a vacancy, if you look back at the, the data. Okay, so for this part of the talk, hopefully I've shown you that actually these antiprospects are quite a challenging um, set of systems to study, and they're really, really difficult to synthesize. And so far, we've had basically no success with the synthesis of those. Um, but we have managed to synthesize the hydrated analogs, much, much easier to make. Um, and we've shown within our experiments that they have long-range lithium ion diffusion um, and limited proton mobility. Um, in the cubic phase, we think that we've identified two distinct environments, um, static OH group and locally mobile um, OH groups, and we've identified this potential mechanism for how these things work. Um, and our experimental findings have been supported by our molecular dynamics um, calculations. So we think that lithium ion diffusion occurs via this vacancy mechanism, and lithium ion diffusion increases with increasing proton concentration. So the more you can manipulate this to get the higher um, ionic conductivities, the better. Okay, so the second um, sort of area I'm going to talk about is understanding compositional doping in lithium stuffed garnets. And this work has been done in collaboration with um, Professor Peter Slater at the University of Birmingham. So um, lithium stuffed garnets have only sort of recently become quite popular um, based on some work done by um, Eddie Cussons at, now at Sheffield. Um, and he basically discovered that you could take a garnet and you can push much more lithium in there than you originally thought. So this is um, on the left. Uh, an example of a sort of basic lithium-based garnet type um, structure. And in that structure, you have the lithium that sits on a tetrahedral site. And then you have these metal, so MO6 off tetrahedral site. In a lithium stuffed garnet, such as this one here, so Li5, La3N2O12, where the metal can be either niobium or um, tantalum, you still have this tetrahedral site for the lithium, but you also have a distorted octahedral site where the additional lithium can go in. So the idea behind these lithium stuffed garnets is you want to create an iron conductor by pushing as much lithium into that structure as possible and forcing it to conduct um, lithium ions. Um, so Peter approached us and said, these materials have been doped before with things like potassium, calcium and strontium. Why can't we dope them with sodium? Um, will that increase the ionic conductivity? Um, of these materials. So we thought, well, let's have a look, because there's lots and lots of things within this um, system that are NMR active. So there's lots of options for, for looking at um, NMR studies. So the first thing we wanted to do was actually confirm that we could actually get sodium into this structure, because obviously it's quite a complicated structure. So where in the, in the actual structure is the sodium going? Based on sort of chemistry and our knowledge of the periodic table, knowledge of um, sizes of things, we presume that the sodium is going to go onto this lanthanum site here. Okay? And the lithium will stay on the tetrahedral and the octahedral site in this stuffed system. So the first thing was to make the materials. We made them and we found that we had a solubility issue. The maximum amount of sodium we could get into this structure was 0.4. Everything else, um, basically, it, wouldn't, it wasn't produced. It, it would make side reactions. It would... Um, pull out the starting reagents, a whole load of things, so it just didn't work. So we could only get 0.2 and 0.4 to go into the system. 
But using Rietveld refinement, which is looking at the long-range diffraction structure, we confirmed that we had sodium in there. So we had two questions at this point. Where does the, the sodium go in the structure? Does it definitely go onto that lanthanum site? That's the first question. And second question is, how does it influence the lithium-ion conductivity? Does it increase the conductivity? Because that's ideally what we want. So the first thing we did was look at this through NMR. And you can see on the top um, spectrum here, this is just like a normal one-dimensional experiment. I'm not doing anything fancy here. And what we see is that the, the spectrum is really, really broad. It looks relatively featureless, and it's not got many things for us to say that's one, two, or three sites. So this is an example where we can use those two-dimensional techniques I talked about at the very start of my talk. And remember, we read these two-dimensional maps as if it's like a contour map if we're hiking in the Lake District. So we're looking at the number of, sort of ridges that we have. Now, in this case, it's quite difficult to really see if that's one or two, but if you look at the projection on here, you can see that actually it looks like there's two distinct peaks. And we can sort of extract parameters for these two peaks that tell us a little bit about those sodium environments. But the main thing is that this sodium spectrum has indicated we have definitely got sodium into that structure. So again, it's a bit of a tick to say it confirms the um, diffraction data. We can do exactly the same for the point four, and you'll see, again, the spectrum on the top looks very broad, quite featureless, difficult to know how many sites. So again, we can apply these two-dimensional techniques, and when we do that, we can see a minimum of three distinct peaks, which is a bit unusual. Because why do we see more sodium sites for point four relative to point two? So the number of sodium environments seems to vary depending on the composition. So this sort of makes us scratch our head, where is the sodium going in the uh, material? So the beauty about NMR is you can actually look at structure indirectly, so you don't have to just look at the element specifically that you're interested in, you can also look at the other elements around. So lithium is also in here. So we can start by doing a lithium-7 experiment. Again, the top spectrum here is just a, a conventional, one-dimensional um, experiment, and you can see it's a relatively broad um, line shape. It doesn't tell us much. So again, we can apply our two-dimensional techniques, and in this case, it's much, much harder to see that it's just a single ridge. It looks very broad, and it seems to be telling us that there's some sort of disorder or something unusual going on with the lithium. Because remember, <coughs> we're supposed to have two distinct lithium sites, one octahedral and one tetrahedral, and we cannot dis differentiate between those two. So in some cases, when, that's, when that happens, we can turn to lithium-6 NMR. And we, we tend to not do this first because it's a complicated experiment. It takes a much longer period of time. Um, but we can do it if we think there's uh, scope for doing it, i.e. if it's going to tell us more. But unfortunately, in this particular case, it gave us just a single broad resonance again and was largely uninformative. So both seem to give us just a single sodium site, even though we know we have two sodium, uh, sorry, lithium sites even though we know we have an octahedral and a tetrahedral site. So again, remember, these materials are, we're wanting to increase the ionic conductivity. So the first thing we want to do with the lithium is see if those ions are actually moving. So we can do this using um, some variable temperature lithium NMR. And again, we want to do this over a much larger temperature range to see how much that lithium can move. And we can see that at room temperature, the line is very, very broad. But as we increase the temperature, it gets very, very narrow, indicating that the lithium is, in fact, moving within this material. Now, I said we wanted to know where the sodium is, but we also want to know if the sodium is contributing in any way to the ionic conductivity of this material, because sodium itself is quite small. It's similar to lithium. It could be also moving through the structure and contributing to that um, conductivity. So what we can do is an experiment known as an X experiment or exchange experiment. And imagine you have two sodium sites next to one another. If they want to switch and exchange places, they can do that. And this is how we can probe it using an X experiment. So if you do get exchange of those two sites, you will see what's re referred to as cross peaks, which is any type of peak off the diagonal. And it can be up here or it can be down here. We did this for a range of different conditions, and it turns out we don't have any exchange of any sodium sites. So wherever the sodium is going into the structure, it's going in and it's staying there. It's not moving. Okay, so it's not contributing to the ion conductivity of this material. So these studies confirm lithium ion mobility, but a lack of sodium mobility. So we can also do um, more sort of traditional 
routes for looking at um, ion conductivity. We can do impedance spectroscopy, um, which is shown here. And we can do this for both the niobium and the um, tantalum-based garnets. And what we find is that, generally speaking, when we put sodium into the um, tantalum garnet, so this one here on the right, we find that actually the um, conductivity decreases with increasing sodium content. So that's not very good. We, we, that's not a particularly good result for us. Um, and what we find for the niobium garnet is that we do get a slight increase in the ionic conductivity at levels of about 0.2, but then it starts to decrease as the sodium content increases further. So it's interesting that the two garnets actually behave differently depending on the, um, the other cation present. Now, we can also do a technique known as um, MUSR, or muon spin relaxation spectroscopy, um, which is all a little bit complicated, but essentially all it's trying to do is it, 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 can imp, imp, it plants itself into a sample and it can watch for ions moving and it can plot the ion hopping rate. So this is any ion that is hopping within the system as a function of temperature. And the only thing we really need to know about this mu SR data is that it's, it, um, for this niobium garnet is it basically corroborates exactly what we're seeing in the impedance data. So we see an increase for the 0.2 sample, but the 0.4 sample decreases. So it looks like the more sodium you put in, the more detrimental it is to the system. So why is that? Um, so yeah, both of the SR and impedance data are in good agreement. So again, I said that we could you know, indirectly look at where things are and what structural changes there are within materials. And I did quite a lot of unusual NMR when I was a postdoc, and lots of people shy away from challenging nuclei, and they don't want to do it because it's quite difficult. But actually, sometimes you get a lot of information from doing that. And here, we've done some static lanthanum-139 NMR, which is still quite niche and quite different. And the idea here was, obviously, we think, we think that the sodium is going onto that lanthanum site, so if we probe the lanthanum directly, does it tell us anything about the location of that sodium? Now, it turns out if you look at the parent material, the 0.2 and the 0.4, they're basically the same. There's, there's no change between them. And um, what's more interesting is in order to fit this line shape, you actually need two distinct lanthanum sites, not one, which is what we would predict from the diffraction data. So it looks like NMR is telling us something more than diffraction at this point. Again, we can try and look at this indirectly using oxygen 17. So Oxygen-16 is not NMR active, so what we need to do is enrich our samples with oxygen-17 in order to be able to do some oxygen experiments, and this is quite a costly process, so you only do this when you really have to do it. Um, so we managed to do this for um, our garnet, um, and we exchanged it successfully. Um, when we do this at low field, we get a spectrum that looks like this, and basically it's really difficult to interpret here how many sites we have, because everything looks like it's on top of one another. Um, so we were very fortunate to get time at the National High Field Facility here in the UK to try and separate out those peaks. And it turns out, actually, when you do that, again, all of the garnets are quite similar. It looks like there's four distinct oxygen sites, but this work's sort of ongoing. And I guess the sort of interesting point here is that NMR is telling us something completely different to the diffraction, the, that there's more or multiple lanthanum sites and that there's multiple oxygen sites, which is different to the, the diffraction where there's one of each. So NMR is really sort of suggesting that we have um, a really quite complicated structure here for these lithium-stuffed garnets. Um, by diffraction methods, it looks like it's on average cubic, but actually if you start to look short range and look at using techniques such as NMR, you actually find that the symmetry is much lower. And that's things like the different number of lanthanum and different number of oxygen sites. So you actually get a lot more structural information from these local probes. Okay, so what do we think is happening in this system? Well, we think that initially when you substitute in sodium into the structure, you do get substitution onto that lanthanum site as predicted. Um, but what we think then happens is that site fills up and actually some of the sodium goes onto the lithium site. And in that case, you're then directly blocking the pathways for lithium to move. Um, so actually, you get a slight enhancement in the niobium case at the point 0.2, but then as soon as you hit the point 0.4, you block some of the pathways um, from going. So it's clearly a size issue. It's because sodium has capability to go into more than one site. 
which is probably not what happened with the potassium, strontium, and calcium versions because they're much bigger. So you really need to think about sort of size in this case. Um, but what we do know is that both diffraction and NMR confirm that sodium are definitely in the, the structure. Um, and as I said, as the sodium content is increased, additional sites are occupied. Lithium suggests that things are moving um, from the narrowing of the lines, uh, but we do think that the sodium could be substituting onto that lithium site. Um, sodium NMR studies indicate that the sodium isn't mobile, so it goes in and it blocks those pores. It doesn't help and contribute to the ionic conductivity. And then, as I said, variable temperature studies indicate the mobility and additional sort of lanthanum and oxygen studies are still ongoing, but they seem to tell, what, what's ha tell us what's happening locally. So hopefully today I've shown you that solid state NMR is actually quite a powerful tool when it's used in conjunction with lots of other techniques. So for example, diffraction and calculations. It can give us information about structure, but it can tell us so much more. It can tell us about dynamics, disorder, sort of mobility, functionality, all those sorts of things can be, um, can be extracted as well. It's particularly useful for energy-related materials, for example, in our case, looking at ions moving. Um, and it's an important tool in understanding these fundamentally yet complex structure property relationships that we have. Um, so I, I guess, where do I think batteries are now and where are they going? So solid electrolytes and all solid state batteries are just one area of research um, into batteries. There are obviously many, many more, including a whole range of things. So you've got people who solely look at cathodes, solely look at anodes for the positive and the negative, um, thinking about processability, how can you put these things into actual devices, mechanical strength, stability, composites, coatings, formulations, miniaturizing batteries for specific applications, looking beyond lithium. So could you put sodium ions in there and get them to move, or magnesium ions, and get more out of your battery? Um, polymer electrolytes, hybrids, the list goes on and on, and this research is worldwide, obviously. Um, battery development and battery-related research remains of great importance. It's highly important that we study these materials to find the next generation of, of materials and devices. Um, so new materials and new chemistries are needed to achieve better performance. So the lithium-ion battery I spoke about at the start with the lithium cobalt oxide and the graphite is what's in your mobile phones, laptop computers, tablets. That's the same chemistry that was first commercialized by Sony in 1990. It's not changed. So we're not at the point of getting this massive step change in performance. And it's not like people haven't been working. There's lots and lots of research being done. It's just we haven't hit the right chemistry. It needs constant research. Now, materials also, if we think about sustainability, they need to be sort of low cost, sustainable, and not damaging to the environment. These are all things that need to be considered when looking at these types of materials. If battery technology is going to be fully embraced by both government and by society, then really it needs to be reliable and affordable. So significant investment is needed. So if you just think about electric vehicles, for example, we don't have the infrastructure for everyone to have an electric vehicle to all come home and charge it at 6, 6 p.m. So it's things like that. And also, society needs to see the benefits of moving away from fossil fuels. We need to sell it to people as a, as a good alternative. And in order to be successful, a combined effort's needed. So whether you're a chemist, a material scientist, a, an engineer, a physicist, um, you know, in industry, an investor, we all need to work together to, to sort of come up with the best solutions and best practices for these new materials and devices. So I'd like to finish there by thanking, well, yourselves for, the, um, uh, for your attention, but also um, to my group members who have done the work. So Tavli Natari was the person who's done the majority of the work on the lithium-rich antiperoscites. Um, Abby Haworth, who um, did the work on the garnets, who now works for the Faraday. Um, I thank all these people for their experimental assistance at various national facilities. Um, all my fantastic collaborators who um, have done amazing work on all these projects. And I thank these people for funding. And again, I thank you for your attention and the invitation to speak here tonight. Thank you. Well, well, there we are, Karen. <laughs> it sounds like an absolutely wonderful detective story to me with so many people to, to investigate in the, in the name of obviously the, the chemicals that you're involved with. Uh, and absolutely fascinating the way that you're actually researching it and coming to conclusions, whether the, you know, the all conclusions are in 
you know, are, are useful. And you, if you've shown the stack in quite a, in a very good way. So everyone here and everyone online, do we have any questions, please? Yes, yeah. could state your name, please, and... Uh, Tom Morgan. So the thing that's limiting it in that case, on those particular materials, is the melting temperature of the material. So we have done stuff at very high temperatures, but not with NMR. We've done it with other diffraction-based methods, and we've taken it to the point where the material melts completely, cooled it down, and we've tried to see if the process returns. And it's quite interesting, because it actually does have memory effects. So this, the material remembers what it was, and it goes back to something similar but not identical, which is in itself a whole other PhD in a whole other area. <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. And often these things do happen. I mean, it was by accident we melted the sample because we had a, an idea roughly where it was going to be, but it actually happened faster than we anticipated. Um, so often we're limited by hardware as to how much we can push those systems. And if it's not hardware, it's the materials themselves because obviously you want them to be within an operational range for real life applications. You don't want them to melt too quickly because otherwise if someone leaves the phone on, you know, they're on holiday in Spain or something in the summer, it'll just, it'll destroy the phone or, or the application. One other thing came to mind in the very last slide when you mentioned the um, uh, polymer membranes because that technology is quite old in uh, hydrogen oxygen fuel cells. Yeah, yeah. So is that an area that's that is because if you can already exchange a proton, proton in that membrane exactly, and protons yeah. are the problem with the perovskites, then uh, that looks like it. Yep, so I, th I honestly think that there's a lot that the battery community can learn from fuel cells and those sorts of people. And that's what I, I was trying to get up with my final comment about people working together. You know, it might be that you take a, a type of technology that's from another area of chemistry and you actually bring that in. And it's just trying to understand how things work, really. And the more communication you have between fields, the better. So yeah, you absolutely could bring in the, the fuel cell stuff. Any, any more questions from the floor? No? No? I think you've shocked them all, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> you've given them so much to think about. They'll probably come back in a few days <laughs> and want you, here, want you to answer a few questions. In fact, I'm sure they will. Uh, so, well, thank you very much, everyone. I'm sure we all enjoyed that. Um, can I call upon now uh, Mr. David Granger, please, to, uh, to give a vote of thanks to Karen? One thing I can say is that inorganic chemistry has moved on a lot since I took my A level chemistry in 1959. <laughs> so, um, yes, okay. <laughs> Having said that, fascinating. Um, but uh, on a lighter note, I, I love some of the terminology. Um, the Perovskites, it sounds like a, a Russian ballet dancer, you know, so I don't know what anti Perovskites would be, but <laughs> come on, uh, one who defected perhaps. Um, the other thing is uh, stuffed garnets, is that something we see on uh, Bake Off? <laughs> um, it uh, reminds me of when I was an you know, undergraduate. Um, Garnet mica schist was the um, wonderful rock type that all first year geologists uh, study, thin section, etc., etc. And who'd have thought in those long off days that uh, now it may be um, possibly the future, shall we say, for uh, lithium batteries? 
Uh, so all these things are, are so interesting you know, from the, the historical point of view for someone like me. But uh, yeah, fascinating because we all know the problems with lithium-ion batteries. Uh, they're big. Uh, okay, things will obviously get smaller over, over time. But uh, we have the problem of, of safety, which, which you uh, mm -hmm. mentioned, because you know we've heard of the lithium-ion batteries catching fire and that sort of thing. Um, so solid state which I'll, would hopefully uh, remove that aspect or, or reduce it considerably. So. Um, but I do like the idea, well, the uh, NMR, um, that, that is fascinating, the, the work that you've done with that, uh, in the way it, it shows so much. Um, I mean, MRI, yes, I mean, I, I, I took part in a research application, so the whole body scan, the head, blah, blah, blah. But, um, you know, to, to use it in the way that you're uh, working is, is, is fascinating. But I do hope that the, the stuff garnets are the way forward because I, I think that, that that is that the name is so <laughs> I don't know, it, it's so wonderful that it, it should have uh, it should have legs. Uh, I like that one. So thank you very much indeed for a fascinating um, talk and we can please show your appreciation. Yes. <laughs> Fascinating. So, could I call upon uh, our secretary, Andrew Dobransky, please, to uh, give us a report on what's upcoming? I think he has done already, but uh, just to remind everyone of which way we're going. Thank you very much, Karen. I think that showed the trials and tribulations of uh, experimental chemistry. Um, and I'm sure this will also keep my father quite happy because he's a big fan of NMR. So, uh, I haven't heard a magic angle spinning and um, deuterium for a while, but there we are. So as I said at the start, our next lecture is going to be by Dr. Richard Curry on sustainable steels. We've asked as well to see if you can put a slant on it for the north of England. So perhaps we, we could bring steel back to the north. But he was another excellent speaker along with Karen, uh, who spoke at our joint DEI NEMI Energy Conference back in last April. The lecture after that, again, is going to be Jeroen van Hoenen from Durham on mine water energy. And then whizzing through the rest of the programme, uh, we have update on the uh, progress of the Colombian Mines Rescue Service, which our institute has also been helping with. John Nash with the Institute of Civil Engineers on the A1. Another excellent mind-blowing talk for you all uh, with terahertz devices in May. Uh, and then back to uh, naval ship design as we, we started with our presidential lecture at the start of the programme uh, and we're going to end it on modern shipping as well. So that's going to bring us full circle. So we look forward to seeing you, seeing you at the rest of the programme for the uh, rest of the year. Thank you very much, Steve. Wonderful. Thanks again, Andrew. Well, uh, closing remarks. Uh, could you all please make sure you have signed a form from the book uh, to prove that you've been here? We do get a certain amount of funding for it. And then after that, would you all be extremely careful going home? Because I know your mind will be completely focused on what Karen's told us tonight. So we'll take great care and try to concentrate on driving. So thank you very much, everyone. Thanks for appearing. And thanks for everyone online, too. And uh, I hope you've been given a lot to consider. So good night. <laughs>